Morning. Uh, thank you so much for coming to um, this briefing on Ebola in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and lessons to be learned from that outbreak. Um, the event is hosted by the Humanitarian Policy Group at ODI, um, and I'm a reporter at Nature, and I'll just be moderating it. I'm not involved with the report, um, but I'm really interested in it. Um, so just to go back, the discussion is about the outbreak in the DRC that began on August 1st, 2018, or at least that's when it officially began. Um, the DRC government and international agencies, and most importantly, the people who were in um, the Grand North of the DRC and leaders and politicians in the, hit, in the cities that were hit by it, controlled that outbreak after 22 months. It was the uh, largest outbreak in the DRC's history, the second largest outbreak in the world, um, and there were over 3,000 cases of Ebola and over 2,000 deaths. And I think most remarkably about this outbreak is that it was in a region that has experienced more than 20 years of armed conflict and it has multiple ongoing humanitarian needs. And that, of course, caused a major challenge and that's sort of why we're analyzing it today. Um, so last month, the DRC declared another Ebola outbreak in the same area. I actually just heard that kind of amazingly, the last uh, patient who was in a hospital with Ebola was actually just released. So we are now on the countdown of 42 days to see if it's the end of that outbreak. So fingers crossed it is. Um, but this will surely happen again. There'll be other Ebola outbreaks or other uh, dangerous pathogens in conflict areas or in fragile zones. And so it's important to learn from these lessons and that's what we're gonna be talking about. Um, we'll discuss things like uh, international leadership in such a response and coordination and ways to engage with communities and get communities to take sort of control of the outbreaks. Um, this discussion draws on themes from the Humanitarian Policy Group's new report, which provides an analysis of the DRC's 10th outbreak with along with recommendations for future responses. Uh, just before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. I'd like to hear from everybody who's joining the webinar today and you can share your thoughts in the chat box. Um, and if you have a question for the panel, do that in the Q&A box. Those are two separate things. So put those in the Q&A box and I will be able to look at those and put as many of them to the panel as I can. Um, if you're on Twitter, feel free to post on We're going to be posting with the hashtag, but we're gonna post the hashtag and the Twitter handles in the chat box right now. So look there for what those are. Um, and there's a couple of nice functions at the bottom of this Zoom box. You can click the CC for closed captions by clicking on that button. Um, and also for those of us who don't speak multiple languages, um, you can click on either French or English also at the bottom of the screen through the interpretation box. And that means it'll be translated for you. Um, this event's also being recorded. The video is gonna be available on the event webpage and you can listen back to this discussion through the ODI event podcast channel. So let's meet everybody here today. Um, so first I'll introduce Diego Zoria. He's the Deputy Humanitarian Coordinator for the United Nations and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Diego has 27 years of experience at the UN in the fields of development cooperation, peace and security, humanitarian assistance, and human rights. His previous positions include UNDP rep Resident Representative in Ecuador and Tunisia, among other places. Um, we've also got Antoine Mushugalusa Chiza, Antoine is the Senior Researcher and Legal Advisor for Social Development at Research Initiatives for Social Development, which is an organization, Bukavu DRC. Antoine is a lawyer and a researcher with expertise in peace building and sustainable development. He's worked on several projects, some with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, and he's worked with the Overseas Development Institute in the past, including on the report that we're talking about today. So also on the panel, we have Nick Crawford. He's Senior Research Associate with the Humanitarian Policy Group and project lead on this report. 
Nick has more than 25 years of experience working on humanitarian, post-crisis and development issues. He's held senior positions with various UN agencies, including the World Food Program, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the UN Development Program. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce Carrie Holloway. She's Senior Research Officer with the Humanitarian Policy Group. Carrie's research interests include the interaction between humanitarian organizations and politics and foreign and domestic policy decisions in relation to refugees. Carrie is an author of the report and she's going to start today's discussion with some of the key findings from the report. So I'll hand it over now. Thank you, Amy. So as Amy mentioned earlier, the 10th Ebola outbreak in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo was declared in August 2018 and wasn't declared over until June 2020. The response was led by the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo with international technical support by the World Health Organization. Controlling an Ebola outbreak in an area that was such, so densely populated and with a highly mobile population and no previous experience of the disease in a context characterized by decades of violence, armed conflict, and ongoing acute humanitarian needs was a significant achievement. So this case study was an independent review of the effectiveness of international leadership and coordination in support of the 10th outbreak response, with the goal of assessing how previous lessons from the West Africa response had been applied, of identifying new lessons, and of making recommendations to inform similar future responses. The study was based on a desk-based literature review and 128 interviews with key informants both in the DRC and globally. So what we found was that the 10th Ebola outbreak was characterized by mistrust from the communities and a mixed record from the government and international agencies on overcoming that distrust and getting the disease under control. The primary challenge early in the response was gaining access to affected communities due to attacks on the response and community resistance. Community resistance in particular stemmed from the response not taking enough time early on to listen and learn from communities about their priorities and to adjust the medically focused response accordingly. This was particularly important since these areas had not previously had Ebola and many people felt the disease was fabricated to disenfranchise the area from national elections, which were held in December, 2018. So despite recognition that the initial response model was ill-adapted to the challenges of the region, several more months would pass before a fundamental reassessment of the strategy was considered. By the time the third strategic response plan was being developed in early 2019, international partners and donors had lost confidence in the response management and its ability to control the outbreak. This reassessment culminated in a fourth strategic response plan that called for a full strength, maximum capacity effort and explicitly emphasized synergies between public health activities and the security, humanitarian, financial, and operational readiness sectors. What this meant in practice was the establishment of a dual-headed coordination structure co-led by a newly appointed Ebola Emergency Response Coordinator and the WHO, and the activation of the Interagency Standing Committee Humanitarian System Wide Scale Up Protocol for the Control of Infectious Disease Events, what used to be known as uh, the protocol that would declare an event an L3 emergency. So despite all this, the synergy between the medical Ebola response and the humanitarian response was never achieved. While some things did improve towards the end of the response, such as community engagement and a more transparent financial tracking, other things like a functioning protection from sexual exploitation and abuse mechanism never materialized. Other health needs also went unchecked and more people died of measles during the same period than Ebola in part because resources were diverted away from routine measles vaccination campaigns to the Ebola response. So I want to conclude by highlighting a few things that our research recommends for future responses in complex settings like Eastern DRC. First, leadership and coordination structures must work together from the beginning. This was also a lesson that came out of West Africa several years ago, but it was not applied in this response and the resulting parallel structure led to confusion and inefficiencies. Leadership and coordination need to involve all key stakeholders in the affected country from the outset. So the UN country team, any peacekeeping forces and other NGOs that are already operating on the ground, including local NGOs. It's the collective expertise and experience of the international system, together with the contextual knowledge of the local uh, NGOs that can best help a government overcome an outbreak in such a complex setting. 
Second, community engagement must be prioritized from the start and go beyond trying to induce or enforce behavior change to understanding each community's fears and priorities in a way that leads to changes in the response that meet the needs of communities. Third, the risk of operating an Ebola response in a conflict environment where national sovereignty is being contested has to be better managed. An overly militarized security approach can itself create further security issues. And sexual exploitation and abuse Use is a huge risk in these kinds of settings, especially in a situation like this, where a huge amount of resources were poured into the region. The PSEA mechanism needs to be put in place from the start. And finally, Ebola should be considered as part of the community's overall health needs, and the focus put on the overall well being of individuals, families, and communities, rather than on a specific disease and its control at all cost. As we saw in the 10th outbreak, it's only when the community started to feel a sense of ownership over the response, and when they believed their overall well-being was being considered, that they began to work together with response actors to protect their families and to bring the outbreak under control. Amy, back to you. Thanks so much. It's great. Um, so I guess uh, let's hear a little bit from Diego. I think, you know, sort of based what Kelly has just talked about and what you've learned from the report, um, what kind of coordination leadership changes do you think need to be made within humanitarian agencies? Let's think of um, the UN and international NGOs. What kind of changes need to be made to better respond to Ebola outbreaks in the DRC? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And thanks for, thanks for having me. And congratulations uh, to ODI and to the Humanitarian Policy Group for this uh, for this report. I mean, I, I I couldn't agree more with the conclusions that we have just heard. I, mean, I think they're all uh, they're all spot on, and I'll try to uh, to elaborate a little bit on the uh, on the conclusion and how we are trying to adapt them to uh, future outbreaks and to the changes that you just uh, you just mentioned to the leadership that we need to uh, that need to be introduced. I mean, let me first say that that I was not I only came at the tail end of the response. So, so my Comments will not be as informed as those of Nicholas or yourselves or even Antoine, who participated uh, in the uh, in the response uh, uh, much more from the uh, uh, from the from the get go. From the get go, I mean, I only came in January and I saw the tail end of the response and the transition uh, towards the uh, post Ebola phase uh, in this in these areas, plus the response to the 11th outbreak and to the 12th outbreak. Because we will come to that in a moment. We have had since then two new outbreaks or one, out, one new outbreak and one resurgence of Ebola in the DRC. So we can actually see how some of the lessons uh, learned from the 10th uh, epidemic uh, uh, and captured in your report have been applied or not. Let me just say also maybe for, the, uh, um, for our listeners that there have been, I mean, I'm very encouraged by all of the amount of research that has gone into uh, the 10th, the response to the 10th Ebola outbreak. I mean, we have the Groupe d'Etudes du Congo has also done a research. We have the Paul Institute with the Martin Luther, Martin Luther Institute has done some research. The NGOs, some of the responders, like the NGOs have done also a lessons learned exercise on the response. There has been, of course, the OPR review conducted by the YASC. Uh, and then we're waiting for the after action review conducted by uh, conducted by WHO. But I mean, the bottom line, I think what everybody agrees with um, is that, uh, and again, I wasn't here, so I, I, it's a little bit uncomfortable for me to talk about, uh, uh, to pass judgment uh, on, on situations that happened uh, before in which I was not, uh, I did not participate uh, directly. But I think that with hindsight, what it can be said is that the response was, was too slow uh, it costed too much money, and it created too many distortions. Uh, and I hope that uh, uh, Antoine will, will will agree with those with those with those things. But I mean, these are things that I've gathered from all the reports and all of the people I've, I've talked to uh, ever ever since. Too slow. I mean, it started uh, officially on the first of August. It probably started in the month of May or June. So it's about uh, uh, over two years to control the uh, to control the epidemic in a very very complicated terrain. You've explained it. Too much money. I mean, I don't know exactly what the final figure is altogether, but we're looking at $800 million or something like that, or maybe even more in a context in which, you know, this is more or less the amount that the humanitarian community gets in total for responses to all of the humanitarian needs uh, in the DRC. So that's uh, equal that, that amount more or less. And too many distortions. I mean, we, 
you have uh, your report that touches on some of them. I mean, you know, armed escorts that had uh, uh, that uh, basically distorted the way in which humanitarian workers were getting to communities, health workers that were being taken from the health structures to provide uh, to uh, uh, an ad hoc functions in the response, community workers that started being paid at levels that equaled uh, salaries and that abandoned uh, abandoned jobs, the PSEA elements that you, that are known to everyone, with more than 50 victims having come forward uh, uh, for cases of uh, sexual exploitation <coughs> and abuse. <coughs> Excuse me, and some accusations also of corruption involving the uh, uh, the uh, the response. I mean, in the end, it was a success, but it came at a very high uh, at a very high, high cost. I mean, let me give, because, I mean, you know, one might be tempted to say, I mean, why, why is it that, that, that everyone collectively did things so slowly, so costly, and with so many distortions? Um, let me just give you a, a little whiff of the context of, uh, of, the, uh, of the DRC. I mean, DRC is, is a huge country. When I say a huge country, I mean, it's five times France. I mean, it's the size of Western, uh, Western Europe. I and mean, the provinces we're talking about are like countries. I mean, North Kivu is three times the size of Rwanda. South Kivu is twice the size of Burundi. Ituri is equal to the size of, uh, of Ireland. It has a poverty rate of 75%. So three in four inhabitants are like living on less than $2, uh, than $2 a, day, a day. You said there had been conflict here for the last 20 years. There's about 120 armed groups uh, in the Eastern DRC that actually have made of militarization of any economic activity, a way of living. So it is not, <clears throat> there's not really a war in the DRC. What there is is that there's a number of armed groups that make of illegal military, illegal economic activities a way, a way of living. The army, unfortunately, cannot be relied upon 100%, and it is actually uh, um, accused of committing about half of the human rights violations in the country, according to the human rights. United Nations Human Rights Office. And this leaves a situation where I mean, the numbers are important. More than 20, 20 million people are food insecure. And we are striving, the humanitarian community, to provide assistance to about 10 million people uh, this year in, 2000, in 2021. So in that context, any assistance that, that arrives, and I've seen it with, you know, with much smaller amounts of assistance that we, uh, that we provide, becomes a little bit of an of uh, uh, um, of uh, um, if not a bounty at least it becomes an issue for discussion and it is not taken at face value it's taken at uh, um, uh, to the extent in which these assistance can actually benefit an individual or group of individuals which are part of the chain in which the assistance is uh, is delivered the needs of the population as as you have mentioned are are multiple i mean to uh, uh, to uh, you know, so so this focus, uh, this was said before, <clears throat> this focus on Ebola is the focus that outsiders have, but the focus that communities have, and not one will talk about this surely with a lot more of uh, uh, knowledge. Um, sorry, excuse me one second. I'm just gonna take a sip of water because otherwise I keep on coughing. <clears throat> to the communities, it's not only when they see this massive display of, of, of people arriving in a zone, um, they expect that these people will be uh, 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 sensitive to the whole of their needs and not only to their, uh, not only to their uh, health needs and definitely not to their Ebola needs, which is, a, which is a, 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 an illness that yes, in total numbers, it affects a large, I mean, we have 3000 cases or so, but in a population of North Kivu has 10 million people and the population of Ituri has 7 million. So altogether, it is not an, 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 an illness that is having an impact in the communities, in the daily lives of people to the extent that we imagine we imagine it has. There are many, many other needs. Yourself, you have mentioned the fact that there have been more uh, deaths by measles in 2019 that there were by, uh, by, by, by Ebola. And in order to support all of these needs, and in particular the health needs, we have a health system which unfortunately is very, uh, it's very poorly equipped to deal with anything. I mean, about three-fourths of health workers do not get paid at all. 
uh, um, I mean, most of them are irregular workers. I mean, they're not recognized by the state and, and three fourths of them do not get paid, do not get paid at all. And they have to survive by asking something from the patients when, when, they, when they arrive. And why is that? Because the budget of the state in the DRC, the budget that the state, a state of 100 million people spends is $4 billion which is you know, a fraction of the state of the city of Paris, just to put it, uh, to put a, 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 compar a, a comparison. So all of these elements, I mean, you know, the, the enormous attention to one single illness, the enormous display of resources um, uh, in a short period, in a relatively short period of time over a very uh, complicated, uh, complicated era led to all of these distortions that the report describes us so well. So since the 10th um, Ebola epidemic was declared over, actually even before that, on the 20th of June, there, had been, there has been an 11th epidemic of Ebola in Equateur, um, in, the, uh, in, a, in a province completely to the west, about 2,000 kilometers uh, from here, um, which took place between the months of June and November. And now recently, as you had mentioned, there has been a spike or resurgence of Ebola in Butembo, one of the areas affected, um, and thankfully, today we're starting the countdown to the 42 days, as you have uh, as you have mentioned. So we hope that this uh, new Ebola epidemic has been uh, brought under control. So what has been done um, uh, differently in these new two new epidemics, the 11th and the 12th, that was not done in the. Or what have we learned from the 10th that we have applied to the 11th uh, and the 12th? I mean, and many of these things actually are are are, are many of the points that we're going to mention in three minutes are things that are mentioned in your report. I mean, one is the reliance on local health structures and the reliance on the local and the provincial uh, health system rather than importing the solution from Kinshasa uh, with uh, uh, responders that get paid hefty per diems and that do not know the context and that do not have the et cetera, which is what happened a little bit of what I saw at the tail end of the 10th response is that the response was completely uh, uh, carried out aside from the provincial health structures and from the médecin chef de zone, the infirmier titulier, titulaire, etc., uh, and relying uh, uh, heavily on outsiders to carry out the response. This has been corrected, and for the 11th epidemic and the 12th epidemic, the main responders have been the uh, local uh, health structures. Second element is to provide coordination of partners to support this public health response um, in a way that relies on the existing mechanisms, exactly as you said in your in your in your recommendations. I mean, relying on existing YASC structures where they where they exist. In the case of Bandaka, we rapidly deployed an OCHA team that ensured coordination with WHO and ensured weekly meetings jointly OCHA and WHO to look at uh, all the responses, all the support being provided by by international uh, and national and national actors and that structure was actually mirrored at the level of Kinshasa to make sure that donors were also aligned with this and that they were not starting funding things that would not be required or things that would be out of sync with what would be the priorities of that public health response. The third element is to rely um, in the response on community acceptance and not rely on military escorts on other sort of means which actually exacerbate problems of security rather than resolve them. This being said, in the, in the north of Beni, it's a very, very complicated uh, zone. Uh, there is one armed group in particular, the ADF, uh, and various other groups that operate under the umbrella of the, or under the guise of the of the ADF that have a modus operandi which is very very brutal, and their uh, you know community acceptance is not really an option because there is no there is no such thing that, that of acceptance. But in other areas, for example, in Bandaka, this is what we are doing, and we haven't been using. We have minimized the use of security forces for the deployment of the uh, response uh, the response team, and the same thing in Butembo. Uh, where we are relying through in community acceptance in areas which are heavily populated by Mai Mai. Uh, so these are uh, self-defense groups, um, but we've relied on community acceptance. And so far there has been no grave security incident in Butembo uh, so far, thank God. And I hope it will continue like, uh, like this. The fourth element, which is to control the economic incentives around all of this. So there needs to be some level of incentive because uh, um, as I said, uh, even health workers in health uh, structures 
are not being paid. So you need to interest them in order to ensure that there will be a response. So this is not a, a, a people that receive regular salaries and that will take it as a, as a sense of pride to actually do more. It's people that need to make a living uh, somehow and that when they're not being paid anyway, are actually have second jobs and third jobs. And if you want them to devote themselves fully to something, you need to pay them to, to pay them an extra, an extra, and we call it a, les primes, uh, les primes pour les prestataires de, 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 de secteur de la santé. The, these primes need to be in consonance with the local economy. Uh, so uh, for the uh, in Bandaka uh, epidemic and now in Butembo, we have issued a, a barème with the ministry saying what are the level of incentives that everyone will agree to pay to those uh, to those health workers that, that are devoted, that are put into the structures, the the the, the traitement d'Ebola and the, and the other structures to control the uh, to control the disease. The barème cannot be too low either, because what we're seeing now today, I just received a complaint by health workers in Butembo who deemed that the barème is too low, and uh, they were expecting actually that the barème, that this barème. Uh, go uh, to the level of the 10th epidemic. To give you an idea, we're talking about $100 for, uh, for a nurse, and we're talking about $40 per month uh, for a coordinator communautaire. No? Whereas in the 10th epidemic, it was various times a multiple, a multiple of that. The fifth point is that it is very, very important to ensure a multi-sectoral response. I mean, to us, I mean, to the people that fund the Ebola response, this is a priority, but to the communities, it is not. I mean, in Bandaka in particular, where there was very, very little humanitarian assistance, we saw, and I'll be done in one minute, we saw in Bandaka uh, um, that, you know, huge malnutrition rates, and we were building very expensive centres de traitement de Ebola, Center for Treatment of Ebola, Ebola Treatment Centers, at a time when Ebola was almost finished, and it had, there had to be an effort and a discussion with the donors to redirect uh, those resources to actually convert those never used Ebola treatment centers into nutrition centers and to longer term uh, programs of support. And then finally, a last point, because this is very uh, visible, unfortunately, is that we need to include PSEA, Prevention of Sexual Exploitation and Abuse Efforts from the outset. However, there is, a, um, uh, I mean, you know, also we need to recognize the difficulties about that because the, um, uh, uh, all the investigations we have carried out show that a large portion of the cases of PSA were actually committed by workers from the Ministry of Health, which fall outside of our efforts. And there's an alliance now with the Ministry of Health to try to, uh, or, or a, a discussion to try to get them to adhere to PSA standards of uh, humanitarian workers. Um, but uh, uh, this is not, uh, this has not been. Uh, so, so, the, so the standards are different and the uh, mechanisms for compliance are different. But in the case of Bandaka and Butembo, we have deployed the teams of the uh, PSEA network uh, immediately from the outset to sensitize and establish the reporting mechanisms which are so necessary in any large scale response. So these are six points of things that we have done differently in the 11th and the 12th Thanks. from the 10th. I think, uh, I think those are great much. points. I don't mean to interrupt, but I think I- No, no, we have to go. To <laughs> thank you. Move along. Um, thank you so much. That was really interesting. I felt, I wanted, I, I feel like maybe one other thing to bring in is this, um, the past resurgence of Ebola in, um, in North Kivu. Uh, that was also caught, I think, pretty quickly, which is maybe a statement also to the ability to have some sort of health structures in place, doctors that could recognize it and report it. Whereas I know the, the you know, the big 10th outbreak, I think it might've started as early as April. I talked to people who had been infected months earlier. So there was also the issue of, of timing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's great that it was caught. Somebody noticed it rapidly. Um, well, thanks so much. Um, I guess I'd like to move on to Antoine. Um, and, and one thing I'm wondering from you, Antoine, is um, I guess maybe you could speak a little bit about uh, what the response to the 10th Ebola outbreak highlighted about how communities were engaged with, and especially you know, with the nice introduction that Diego gave, that this is in a context where people have been badly disenfranchised for years. They have plenty of reasons to mistrust authorities, both from you know, government officials from Kinshasa, as well as you know, outsiders like UN workers who had, you know, let them down in the past. So, you know, how do you engage with a community where there's that sort of history?
and you know, just to open it up to you I, more broadly, I think you're going to speak about community engagement. Um, so I'd love to hear it. Thank you, Diego, for your uh, presentation. Thank you, Amy. At my uh, level, I'm going to try to talk about the uh, aspect that related to, to the community uh, involvement and uh, 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 participation of the population in, uh, the, in relation to Ebola and DRC. I would like to mention first that the uh, community uh, engagement, you know, has uh, changed depending on the phase of intervention, you know. Uh, you know, uh, from uh, one phase to the others, you know, uh, during the uh, 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 response to the 10th uh, uh, outbreak, we had a lot of reasons that led in particular to, uh, you know, uh, some uh, centers being burned, you know, a treatment center for Ebola, or maybe uh, uh, trucks of vehicles of the intervention uh, that were burned. That was due in particular and mainly to the fact that there was, uh, you know, uh, some staff that were hired. They didn't know the local, local language. They didn't know the custom, uh, uh, the local customs. And also what we've seen, uh, you know, uh, signs of resistance is that uh, we've seen a, a murder, which, uh, uh, the Cameroon doctor Richard Musoko from the WHO, who was murdered uh, in 2019 uh, in the North Kivu. And uh, we also have uh, had a number of rumors that circulated and mentioned the fact that uh, the uh, population, the member of the communities, thought that the uh, Ebola uh, outbreak was a fabrication uh, to, uh, in order to try to deprive them of their right to participate to the election process that were planned for December 2018, which led to a number of political recuperation and, uh, you know, and also economic consequences uh, 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 at the time of the 10th uh, Ebola outbreak in DRC. Also, communities have uh, uh, criticized the fact that were a uh, response team that were uh, made of mostly of foreign workers uh, to the detriment of local workers who know very well the context text, uh, who know uh, very well uh, uh, the uh, local situation, uh, uh, the local situation, you know, and you will, uh, 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 in terms of uh, community development, uh, you know, thank God the things have improved uh, as early as we started to intervention with the involvement of uh, uh, re community relays, uh, with the intervention of uh, inter international organizations, uh, religious leaders, uh, uh, and all the uh, 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 social and local actors at the local local community. I should mention the fact that uh, a, a, a commission was set up uh, to uh, work on risk communication and community uh, engagement. You know, and there was also a lot of work being done uh, uh, with the community feedback working group, uh, working collaboration uh, with the uh, uh, collaboration with the social science action unit. So that was a very good improvement. Uh, uh, and an improvement of the community engagement uh, when we started to communicate the risk. And we also noticed that uh, in the uh, response to the 10th epidemic, you know, the uh, uh, you know, uh, for uh, uh, local actors, uh, for, so you've noticed maybe, you know, for so of all the, the response to the 10th epidemic, Ebola epidemic was uh, very heavily characterized by the non-involvement uh, of, uh, or at least the weak involvement of local actors. Uh, there were, there were, you know, uh, uh, there were some local organizations, local authorities, civil society leaders, but even the lo local organization that uh, uh, got involved had a uh, logistic and financial uh, difficulty that didn't allow them to implement their policies uh, in terms of the response uh, during the. In the many interviews that were uh, that we contacted, uh, uh, especially in the. Uh, province of uh, North Kivu and uh, Short Kivu, you know, a, a very, very large majority of the people that were interviewed have stated that uh, they didn't, uh, 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 that nobody asked them to be involved in the uh, main decision-making process, even though they knew very well the context and the intervention areas. Uh, the, uh, the response to the 10th Ebola epidemic outbreak in uh, DRC was also characterized by this uh, uh, phenomenon that, that 
which was called Ebola business. It's a, a, a Ebola business. It's a, it was perceived by the population, which was affected by the Ebola crisis, as if Ebola was had been uh, conceived, uh, you know, uh, uh, starting with the tenth uh, outbreak, as a means to mobilize resources to the uh, response. Uh, and uh, and that people have been trying to profit excessively, uh, you know, and they profited to uh, the elite and, and not to the patients, you know, and uh, not to the communities, um, uh, as we have mentioned it uh, repeatedly. Instead of mentioning the doctors, you know, and sort of trying to help the local uh, health center, you you want to notice that the leadership of the response, you know, used uh, you know uh, experts coming from Kinshasa, or coming from outside countries other African countries and the community didn't like that. You know, we've also heard of allegations of corruption or even, uh, 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 you know, a mistake that were character that characterized the tense uh, intervention in corruption because when uh, vehicles were rented or in the uh, in the rental of, uh, you know, reservation of hotel rooms uh, where, you know, the st staff was uh, of the uh, 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 response teams, you know, uh, were supposed to be hosted. So the costs were very high and it benefited most Mostly the elite, uh, you know, we mentioned that you know, contrary to the traditional healthcare system, there, there were payments that were made to uh, really uh, communities, uh, really center uh, that were selected because they were closed to, or because, you know, the people had some relative who were working in the response of the, to the 10th uh, Ebola epidemic. So that also created a, a, a trust problem. And they, in fact, you know, also uh, uh, threatened the, uh, you know, benevolent, you know, or the, uh, the voluntary effort, you know, that we could have had in the various regions of the country, because before they were working for free uh, this team. So to, uh, still in relation to this uh, Ebola business, I would like to repeat an excerpt from what Diego said. Yeah, Diego uh, has uh, uh, mentioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, he mentioned several people that we uh, interviewed. He mentioned that the intervention of women in the Ebola response uh, rested mostly on uh, sexual favors, uh, you know, was mostly made of sexual favors and uh, constituted uh, a standard, uh, you know, to uh, hire them or to determine their salary as a um also, I'm going to try to mention um, the uh, lesson learned, uh, which were a leverage, you know, uh, in the uh, uh, response to the 10th uh, Ebola epidemic uh, outbreak uh, and outbreak in the uh, DRC. I would like to mention uh, uh, immediately that the uh, uh, response to the 10th uh, Ebola outbreak in the DRC has allowed to implement a uh, consolidation program and uh, and uh, post Ebola cons uh, consolidation program in the North Kivu and South Kivu and also in the province of Litori in the context where we also had COVID-19. And that plans uh, goal, as a number of participants have already had access to it, they would know about it. The goal was to consolidate the what we had learned from the response uh, to the Ebola outbreak and to maintain a level of vigilance, uh, an, uh, an acute level of uh, uh, vigilance, and to increase uh, the quality of the healthcare system uh, in the country, in uh, the DRC. To give you an illustration, I would like to mention that the fact that uh, in terms of the uh, individual behaviors um, among the uh, uh, found that we were found that, you know, there was, uh, yeah, I could mention that the, uh, the issue of uh, hand washing, hand washing was strengthened during the 10th uh, uh, Ebola outbreak in the DRC and the uh, people are maintaining that good practice. But during the 11th uh, Ebola outbreak, break in the Equator in the uh, region in the DRC, and in particularly during that period when we are also facing the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this were maintained. Uh, uh, among the uh, lessons learned that were leveraged in, uh, you know, in relation to the 10th outbreak, I would like to mention, you know, uh, the, the use of uh, 
uh, 800 numbers or the equivalent of 800 numbers that were activated and put in surveys for the uh, team, uh, the response team. Uh, and another lesson that was learned and uh, leveraged the communication arrays and the uh, community engagement. There was also the setting up of a very well-structured system to collect uh, treatment uh, and collect of feedback and uh, how the uh, people were perceiving the uh, response, you know, with a way of going from the quantitative to the qualitative in terms of this feedback. And in fact, we used a triangulation of those data uh, uh, with the uh, uh, science, uh, social science uh, research team uh, helping in this area. So I think yeah, that was a great le lesson that allowed to provide a better response uh, to in the context of the 11th outbreak uh, of Ebola. And it's still uh, help to uh, uh, respond better to, uh, you know, the uh, 19 and the current uh, 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 pandemic uh, uh, outbreak. So now I'm going to give up the floor to Amy so that we can uh, continue. Thank you so much for that. Um, Merci. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I want to kind of follow up with one quick question for you. Um, so because community community engagement is one of those like simple words that we know is really hard. I mean, even in the US with COVID, we've clearly done a very poor job with community engagement. People still don't believe we need masks and so forth. Um, so, you know, with community engagement, a kind of a two way conversation is the ideal. Um, and I saw some of that when I was in Butembo and Benny briefly, but you know, the question is like, how do you get that to work on a large scale? And also there's the question of involving more of the community is clearly the way to go. Um, but I wonder if you think it contributes to kind of this um, sort of anger about pay if community, community members are being paid, uh, you know, are being asked to volunteer or to work for a very small per diem, but they can see kind of international staff or government or people from Kinshasa, you know, being paid a lot, but also, you know, staying in very nice hotels, especially like in Goma and just helicoptering in, which we know is expensive for, you know, a few hours. And I just wonder, does that kind of discrepancy in payments sort of add to this Ebola business idea? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for that question. I should mention the fact that their uh, compensation isn't something that was paid attention to. There are certain uh, uh, salary rules that need to be followed when it comes to a international staff, and and they should also be transferring uh, skills to locals. And we should be paid more attention to the salary discrepancy. So uh, there's these huge differences and that creates frustrations uh, at the, among the national uh, domestic health care providers and amongst communities. They were very frustrated because they saw how their uh, their, their daughters' sons, uh, were, their uh, relatives were being treated uh, by people coming from other countries, uh, from elsewhere in Africa, from elsewhere within the, the DRC. So that's what led to this concept of uh, the Ebola business. So a case of Ebola was identified in the DRC, in Mangini, Oarija, uh, in Mombasa, or Moinga, or South Kivu. So for one case of Ebola, we had to uh, to mobilize more more than twenty vehicles coming into a village, and that created frustration because people felt that people were not coming for a a, a, a response to a, a a general public health concern. They felt they were just coming, just only deal with this question of Ebola. People felt that Ebola was just a business. That's what many members of the community have said in the places that we visited. And they felt that it uh, was not a, an a overarching healthcare response. Thanks so much. 
Um, that makes sense too. Um, okay, let me take a question from our uh, audience. Um, so Victor asks, um, and I'll and I'll put this question I think to Nick Crawford. Um, Victor asks, uh, he'd like to hear more about sort of the best practices in risk management. So we know this was sort of an insecure area. There were attacks on Ebola responders kind of uh, both locally and internationally. Uh, and so what's the best management, management for humanitarian agencies to work in kind of a setting like this? At the same time, we know that there was issues with um, you know, the appearance of soldiers in the area and that creates a whole nother set of problems. Okay, uh, thanks, Amy, and welcome to everybody. Um, let me just uh, encourage everybody who's joining today to, to download the report and read and, and read it. We're, we're looking forward to hearing feedback from everybody. Um, yeah, this is a difficult question, safe access in a conflict-affected area. Um, what I would say is that, um, and, and what we saw in, you know, in our case study was that you really need to, uh, you need to be working with the actors on the ground who understand the, the context and who have worked in a security context in the region. And Diego mentioned some of these things as well. I mean, one thing that we found uh, or what we heard is that uh, using armed escorts, for example, in DRC is a last resort for, for the humanitarian community. And when they do use armed escorts, uh, they use the police and they're sort of set payments that are made for them. Uh, in this response, you know, not just the police were used, but also uh, the armed forces, the, uh, the military, and the payments were much higher. You know, some of the other UN country team members told us that when they understood how much was being paid, you know, to the, to the military or to the police, they were really shocked at those levels. So that's a sort of, as, as Diego mentioned, a, a sort of security, uh, securitization that can bring even more problems into your response. So, I mean, there's always a balance between in a, in a conflict situation with high insecurity. And I'm not saying there wasn't, there weren't good reasons for using our best courts in some places, but you have to have some balance and use the experts that are there on the ground. And there in DRC, we had a UN mission uh, very well versed in the armed actors and in uh, managing security risks around the country. We had a UN country team as well that for 20, 25 years has been working that way. So I would say it's different in every context, but really use the assets and the, and the expertise that is on the ground when you're building your risk mitigation strategy. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so there's another really interesting question here, and I hope I understand it correctly. And uh, uh, Adama can correct me if I get it wrong. And I think I'll put this one to Diego. Um, and so the question is, if you involve more local actors or has the involvement of more local actors within the response, does that lead to more trust and therefore a faster way to stop Ebola transmission? Or if your emphasis is on involving more local actors and maybe less say, you know, sort of militarized or kind of more uh, forced from the outside, or might that kind of slow the amount of time uh, to get the, the responses that you're kind of hoping people do, um, you know, when it comes to following very restrictive measures like, you know, dousing people's belongings in chlorine or things like that. And, and let me know if that's, that's incorrect. I wanted to make sure it was clear. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, yeah. I, I mean, I think there's this. I mean, definitely. I mean, we, we. I mean, definitely, the push should be to use local actors, and this is the recommendations of your report, and this is what Antoine has been uh, has been saying. And I think that bringing in outside actors, which also brings about a whole economic system attached to these outside actors, uh, is a way to actually. Uh, uh, perpetuate uh, uh, problems and to create more, uh, more, more problems. But then there's an issue about capacity. And this is the issue is that what we need to do, I mean, what there needs to be is actually an, an, an improvement in the capacity of the local uh, health responders in order to be able to identify and to respond and to provide early responses to, to Ebola and to carry out, for example, surveillance and to carry out once Ebola is declared, to actually carry out surveillance. So, so, so you have, there, there is a tension, I think, between 
on the one hand, you, you need to empower local actors and do local actors. On the other hand, there needs to be sufficient capacity. Those local collectors need to have sufficient capacity. And to start with, even, you know, I mean, even uh, a, a means of transportation, I mean, motorbikes to actually get to places and uh, 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 credit for the SIM cards that they need to use in order to contact back, etc. So the issue of lack of capacity of local actors is a big, is a big, is a big, uh, is a big uh, a break to the response, but bringing in outside actors and, and certainly uh, sidelining the local actors is also a very bad idea. So it needs to be a combination of both, I think. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, one kind of question I have, and, and perhaps maybe one of you can raise your hand if you think you're the best to, to speak to this. I don't think I've met any, um, you know, when I talked to WHO or anyone else, I think it could be agreed upon that it would be better to support more universal healthcare sort of things, you know, healthcare for, like we've mentioned, it generates a lot of mistrust when you only come for Ebola, but don't care about deaths from malaria or in childbirth or things like this. Um, but this requires, that's not really a crisis situation, whereas Ebola is a crisis situation. So, right. So, you know, I guess I'm just wondering, um, you know, is a crisis a good trigger for more like sort of sustainable support around, you know, healthcare that's delivered by the people in the community? Um, does anybody have any ideas for how that, how that gets funded? Okay, Diego. Well, I mean, just just to say that in the uh, in the, in the tenth Ebola response, and maybe that was a lesson from West Africa. I did not participate in the West Africa response. In the tenth Ebola response, there was a plan to have a large post Ebola program to actually ensure that there would be a, a, a strengthening of the health system, also linked to survivors, because as we have seen, survivors uh, can actually transmit the uh, disease for many. We thought many months, and now it appears a few years uh, after they have been declared free from the uh, free from the disease. So, hence the importance of strengthening the health systems, in particular in those in those areas. I mean, what we I mean that plan to actually have a large post Ebola program was was shelved because of other priorities, not the least the 11th outbreak in Bandaka. But nonetheless, I mean, the World Bank has come with a $50 million program uh, to strengthen health systems in Ebola affected areas. And the uh, uh, and the SURF uh, has also provided $40 million for post Ebola programming in those areas. And it's probably that those resources, Amy, that contributed to strengthening the uh, health systems that were able to detect the new outbreak of Ebola in, uh, in Butembo. So I think it's not ideal, but there is attention being paid to that. And the fact that we cannot just pack up and leave uh, once Ebola is declared over, but there needs to be a, a continuation of support to health structures uh, uh, for, for many months and years. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll take another question from the audience. Um, and I guess this would be great if Antoine uh, and or Nick wants to speak to it. Um, so, you know, community engagement, again, um, it was talked about a lot in the West African Ebola response. It's talked a lot about now. And um, we see in the COVID-19 response, um, there's sort of a lot of top-down decision-making um, where you don't get communities, uh, whether that's in the US or in other countries, uh, really, we're not bringing them along and understanding why, uh, why they should be engaged with us and that they have the power to control a lot of the spread. So um, I guess the question is, so why do you think that community engagement is often overlooked in public health and humanitarian responses kind of around the world or, you know, both in rich countries and in poor countries? So yeah, what, what, what's up with it being sort of pushed aside and thought about later, uh, Antoine or Nick? Well, I was going to uh, let Antoine answer, <laughs> but uh, I uh, let me jump in. I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, and our team was not uh, public health experts, and we were looking at the international leadership and coordinated coordination structures. But you know, I think that that uh, you know we looked at the lessons from West Africa, as you said. Why is community engagement, you know, overlooked, or why is it so difficult to 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 get right? And I think, you know, again, just getting back to um, uh, to what we heard from people on the ground there, and that 
that was very much a sort of need to respect and listen to uh, the real priorities and needs of the community that's there. And if you're coming, uh, as we heard this response was, with a fixation on what you as an outsider perceive as the, uh, the absolute, you know, imperative uh, uh, objective, and in this case, to, to get rid of the disease, then sometimes you're not listening to the priorities and, and overall needs that are facing that community. And I don't want to extrapolate this out to the US and COVID, but that's what we saw there. And I can imagine that any community that is sort of faced with the imposition of a model that they don't understand and that is not relevant to the real pressing needs in their lives might be hesitant to, uh, to embrace that. And I think what we saw over the course of this, uh, of this response was slowly backing out of that imposition of a model and beginning to adjust it and try to address other problems in concert together with what the international community in particular saw as the main threat, uh, and that was Ebola. Um, well, we've only got about five, you know, a few minutes left. Um, so I'm, first I should say, Antoine, if uh, you're waiting on the translation and you want to speak, let me know. But otherwise I can move on to another question. Um, okay, I'm going to move on. Um, I guess just sort of to kind of wrap up at all, um, you know, what would you say, um, I think, you know, uh, we've talked about communication a lot. Is there something else, uh, you know, uh, Nick or Diego or Antoine, is there something else that we haven't really talked about that you think is one of the most important adaptations? I mean, for me, a simple one after reading this report is, I can't believe we don't even know if it was 800 or 1.2 billion that was spent on this, um, you know, and why is there not good accounting for where the money goes and how much is being spent? I would think that would be hiring financial people to keep track of that. Um, but yeah, let me ask uh, Nick speak for your uh, your final your final word. No, let me let me just come in quickly. I mean, one of our recommendations very much is around the use of resources and just how you know when you throw that many dollars into a situation like this, just how corrosive that can be to the environment. So some of our recommendations are really around just trying to be mostly transparent about that money. Who is it coming from? Who is deciding where it's going and how is it being spent? And just as a start that, uh, you know, we think that can make a big difference in tampering that and also giving you information about exactly what the, what the response costs. But I think one issue that we didn't really touch on it's just, uh, and, and it was in the last question a little bit, is about long-term investment in the public health structures of the country. And just to give one example here, uh, the US government spent about $600 million on this Ebola response uh, in a 22 month period. Over 20 years, the US spent $1.6 billion on investment in health in the DRC. So just in this response, they spent 40% of their overall investment in infrastructure, health infrastructure in the country just in 22 months. And that it's that kind of infrastructure in the end that is really gonna build uh, the, the, the ability of communities and local health structures to be able to confront future outbreaks and, and, and future health crises. Stop there. Very good point. Maybe I can come in so that we leave the last word to uh, to Antoine, um, if he if this is okay. I mean, yeah, just to uh, to build on what Nick has just has just said, and that investment of this six hundred million or, or of the U.S. government, uh, which was very very generous, but unfortunately it was not durable. I mean, all of these uh, Ebola treatment centers that have been built and all of this money that has been spent. 
and unfortunately have not been spent on the strengthening of the, uh, of the health system have been, so the, the Ebola treatment centers that were built uh, were built uh, with uh, with uh, plastic sheeting and uh, because they were and this is this goes to my to my and, and, and therefore became unusable a few months a few months later which is one of the things that the uh, Congolese authorities request is that the, the more permanent structures be built but of course this takes time and this is exactly the point I wanted to make is that is that in order to I mean the, I, I feel that the you know the, the the priority to stopping the disease and to ensuring surveillance on a disease which is so little because it is immensely little even in this 12th outbreak of resurgence 50 percent of lethality still when we have vaccines and we have um, and we have treatment makes that many other considerations are not being taken into account at that moment and that makes that stopping it and being very quick and very rapid means that we can justify means and we can justify setting aside principles but in the end what happens by that is that we actually if we do not abide by those principles that your report recognize then we're probably contributing to prolonging the state of affairs so it's important to uh, strike a balance between being expedient and throwing resources at the problem because they are needed and at the same time being careful in the way it is done uh, so that we don't create distortions which can actually uh, uh, worsen the problem thank you very much Um, thanks a lot. I think we've lost Antoine, um, but we're at time anyways. And, you know, just sort of maybe as a final remark, I'll make it a, a comment and not a question, but this is from uh, uh, Caroline at um, MSF, not surprisingly, because the question is, you know, how do we do something more than just another lessons learned talk? I think there were so many of these after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and and so, yeah, I think just to leave it with that, let's let's see what we can do to make this more than you know a great webinar session, which I really think it is. And there's tons of questions I didn't get to. They're really great. I would be, I don't know, put them on Twitter. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for everyone for coming and for the panelists. You were all really wonderful. Um, and just a reminder, I think uh, I want to also remind you and uh, that the link to this report is going to be in the chat box. It's also online and it's in uh, Twitter. Um, and there'll be a recording of this event on the webpage for a few days. Thanks a lot.